Our next speaker is Marina Raixex from the Universitat Pompeu, and she will tell us about isoforms, mRNA isoforms in the ribosome. So, uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization for giving me the opportunity to present my work about measuring ribosome profiling at isoform level, which can provide a closer view of the functional impact of alternative splicing. In our group, we've been working for years with RNA-seq data uh, from, uh, in order to identify the different isoforms that are expressed in a sample or also to, to find alternative in isoforms between two conditions, like normal and tumor samples. Uh, however, how these isoforms are going to become um, functional protein products, it's not so clear, since there are processes like nonsense-mediated decay or transition regulation that make this step not so straightforward. Additionally, there's very few evidence from mass spectrometry experiments so for this reason, we propose to use ribosome profiling, or riboseq, which is basically the deep sequencing of RNAs that are occupied by ribosomes, providing evidence of translation. Uh, riboseq grids have already been used uh, to identify alternatively spliced events that are engaged by the ribosomes, but in this work, uh, we were wondering uh, what is the pattern in the whole series. With these ideas in mind, uh, we had the following goals to develop a pipeline for isoform quantification from riboseq reads, to define the landscape of translated isoforms in different data sets, and also to identify differentially spliced isoforms and events with evidence of translation. Uh, moving to the first part of the quantification and how we look for evidence of translation, we had different uh, data sets with uh, paired RNA-seq and riboseq experiments. Uh, we had data from Glioma in, for human and mouse, and also in the case of mouse, hippocampus and embryonic stem cells. And uh, we performed the quantification in the following way. Uh, for RNA-seq, uh, we um, get the abundance values uh, in TPM, so transcripts per million, using salmon. But uh, we took this serious annotation in order to make easier the comparison with uh, riboseq. And for riboseq, we use a software called Ribomap that estimates the riboseq counts, uh, taking into account the abundance of uh, RNA-seq. Once we have the counts, we will calculate the abundance for riboseq. Similarly, what we do with uh, TPM, but in this case, uh, we will call it OPMs or ORs per million, uh, which are the, our abundance units for riboseq. Additionally, we are going to evaluate the evidence of translation uh, with two key features of ribosome profiling that are periodicity and uniformity. Periodicity is expected to occur at every three nucleotides corresponding to codon triplets. Uh, we evaluated the periodicity in the most abundant frame, which is the first frame. And then for uniformity, it basically stands for uh, how the reads are distributed across the, the open reading frame. Uh, that's uh, how the distribution of, of uniformity and periodicity look like for a data set. In this case, it's uh, normal glia from human. 
But how can we establish a threshold for translated isoforms in this map of points? We need to define a control set. Our control set is formed by single isoform genes with mass spectrometry evidence according to the human protein atlas and also that are housekeeping, meaning that they are expressed in all tissues. We will set the cutoff values at the top 90% of the periodicity and uniformity distributions of this control set here, these blue points. And we will keep uh, all that's falling here as translated. With this criteria, uh, we have been able to uh, identify 70% of the expressed isoforms with evidence of translation. Among those, uh, between 13 40% are not belonging, uh, so are not from single isoform genes or are not the most expressed ones. Uh, so they are uh, less expressed isoforms within the gene. And if we look at the coverage uh, along the, the CDS, in three different windows at the start, in the middle, and at the end of the CDS, we can see that this coverage is uniform. Uh, even if we look at our control set, uh, the most expressed isoforms or uh, secondary isoforms. We validated this set of uh, translated isoforms at gene level with information of uh, protein evidence in the human protein atlas. And you can see that the overlap is huge. We also perform additional validations uh, regarding uh, to each CDS. We took uh, uniquely mapping reads and also peptides uh, mapping to regions that are unique to each CDS. These unique regions can be defined as regions that are not present in any, in any other transcript within the same gene, or uh, even that they have an overlap, uh, it's occurring in different frames. Uh, so, uh, for the uniquely mapping reads, uh, we can validate uh, between 20 and 40 percent of the available isoforms uh, with more than 10 reads falling in these unique regions. And this represents up to 60 percent of the CDSs that we establish as translated. We need to take into account that the average uniquely mapping rate from the star output we get in for ribosic reads is around 20 and 30 percent. So this is a great results. Uh, then uh, if we look at the read density in these unique regions, uh, we can see that it can separate in three different peaks the translated isoforms here in purple, the ones that are all expressed in orange, and the ones that are not evaluated because uh, overall have less than 10 ribosic roots. And for the validation with proteomics data, we use peptides from the PRIDE database, mapping to these unique regions. Uh, and if we look at the percent of translated CDSs uh, that have a peptide mapping there, uh, we separated this according to the length of the unique regions, because as you can see, uh, we can validate a great proportion of unique regions with more than 200 nucleotides uh, and even single isoform genes, but it's really difficult to find peptides in shorter unique regions. And now uh, I'm going to explain how we perform the differential splicing analysis. We use SUPA, a software developed in our group that takes RNA-seq uh, abundance values in TPMs and is able to calculate the difference between two conditions in the percent spliced in value or PSI in the case of events and transcript usage in the case of isoforms. Our two conditions are going to be gliangioma from the human and mouse datasets. And well, this software is, uh, can be easily used with our ribosic data since we have calculated this uh, OPM value, which is similar to the TPM, and we can perform the same calculations just changing the TPM for the OPM. Uh, I'm going to explain first the differential the results for the differential spliced isoforms. Uh, we did the analysis separately for RNA seq and ribosic, and here I'm showing the difference in transcript usage against the, the p value. But uh, what we are interested on is uh, in the overlap between these two. And if we look at the overlap, it represents around 40% of the, the changes we found in, in RNA seq. And those changes that are found in both RNA-seq and ribosic 
uh, preserve the direction and also the magnitude of the change, as you can see here in this correlation of the RNA-seq uh, differential transcript usage versus uh, the ribosome. Uh, moreover, uh, between uh, so these changes uh, were affecting around 50 and 60 percent of uh, uh, sorry the 50 and 60 percent of these changes were affecting CDSs that we define as translated in at least uh, one condition. For the differential splice events, we performed the analysis in the same way, and we. Uh, we have seen again this consistency in the direction and the magnitude of, of the changes that occur in both RNA seq and ribosome. And uh, for events, the validation is performed using uniquely mapping reads in the exon junctions or uh, within the exon boundaries. And using reads, we could only validate 60% of the, the skipping exon events. We only analyzed the skipping exon events for the validation. Uh, most of the reads uh, are found in, in the junctions, around 70%. And well, mm, this low percentage of validated events may be due to the, the low uh, uniquely mapping reads uh, in ribosic data, but uh, we think that it reinforces the idea that it's more powerful to look at the whole CDS in order to define uh, something as uh, translated or to look for evidence of translation. Uh, also, uh, in these changes that were um, significantly found changing in, in RSEC and also in RIVOSIC, uh, we have observed an enrichment of microexons. And well, what are those microexons? Uh, they are uh, short skipping exon events, shorter than 51 nucleotides, that uh, have found to have a role uh, in neurogenesis and in neuronal differentiation and also to be misregulated in disease condition, more precisely in autistic brains. So since we have a glioma data, we thought it was interesting to look at the behavior of these microexons in our data. And what we have observed is that there's a decreased inclusion of microexons in glioma. Uh, here, microexons are represented by red dots, and you can see these buyers to, towards uh, negative uh, delta PSI values so negative inclusion values. We tested it against other longer skipping exon uh, events and it appeared to be significant. Uh, we think that this may be indicative of uh, the differentiation pattern in glioma since they are related to, to neuronal differentiation. Here also I'm plotting a, an example of a microexon falling in this GOPC or FAG gene that has a clinically relevant fusion described in, in glioblastoma also. And if we look, uh, if we zoom in in this small exon here, the microexon, uh, you can see that we are able to find reads uh, mapping here in the microexon for glia, but this doesn't occur in the case of glioma, which is here below. And finally, uh, since we had uh, data for human and mouse, we thought it was interesting to look at the orthologous skipping events in both species. We took the set of uh, annotated human events, we lifted the, co the coordinates using synteny alignments, and we compared the coordinates to the events that are annotated in mouse. Uh, we have recovered around uh, 1,500 uh, orthologous events, uh, containing uh, microexons and also longer skipping exon events. And if we look uh, how these events are changing in both species, uh, we see that uh, around 70% of these orthologous events precede the direction of the change in uh, both species. Here I highlighted also the microexons again, so you can see this, this bias towards negative delta PSI values. Maybe here it's more clear. And well, just uh, I'm going to conclude. In this work, we have developed a pipeline that allows us to obtain abundance values from ribosic reads. And so this data can be used as an input for tools that are commonly used for RNA seq, since I have shown for SUPA for differential splicing. 
Well, we have also defined that 70% uh, of the CDSs that are quantified with RNA show evidence of translation, and that up to 60% of those can be validated with uh, reads in the unique regions. Also that 40% uh, of the differentially spliced isoforms and events in RNA-seq show a consistent measurable change in ribosic. And we have also observed that this decreased inclusion in, of microexons in glioma that may suggest a differentiation pattern. And finally, we have shown that orthologous events between both species tend to preserve the direction of the change indicating the functionality of these alternatively spliced events. Uh, this is our group. Uh, I want to thank also Maron Jorge that helped a lot in the project and a special thanks to the ISCB for awarding me with the, the Travel Fellowship. And well, that's all. I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Well, it's yeah. The the question was, uh, what is the the sequencing depth we have in in ribosic? Uh, it's uh, really variable uh, through all the data sets. Uh, I don't have uh, the numbers in mind right now, but uh, I can say it's, uh, it changes a lot depending on the the quality of the data set, and it's uh, kind of determining of the results that you can expect later. Well, the thing is, uh, even uh, we don't have uh, a great depth, uh, we think that what we observed in, in ribosic, uh, so I would be more worried about uh, noise uh, when we have a lot of reads there, uh, but the reads we observe, uh, I think I'm pretty confident that Well, the thing is, that, that's, uh, so the, the question is, is related to a recent work by Alfonso Valencia um, that uh, well, was talking about the, uh, the real impact of this uh, splicing and how it affects proteins. Uh, the thing is, um, that's um, why we are working with it, uh, to, to prove that maybe uh, it's not, uh, so it's not as much as, uh, he, he argues, but well, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we are very limited uh, when always when comparing to proteom proteomics data, uh, and this is why we, we thought that ribosic was a good approach, at least uh, by the moment. I, I have one more question. Okay. <laughs> so, so you show this correlation of, of alternative splicing changing mm -hmm. as well as you see these new isoforms showing up in the ribosome. Mm -hmm. Are there outliers? Are there some where that's not the case? Uh, well, the, um, they are. Uh, so in the correlations, uh, the, the outliers were included, in fact. So it's like uh, two or three cases. Uh, the 99% of, of okay. the events that we found in, in both data sets uh, change in the same way. Okay. One more question. Uh, well, that's uh, okay. The question is, it's uh, why are we using uh, TPMs? Uh, we we are used to to this pipeline using salmon obtaining TPMs, and we thought uh, it was uh, really easy to to adapt to to ribosy. So that's the only reason I think. <laughs> Uh, I 
Oh, so the the question was if the the microexons are more likely to to be found in polysomes, right? Uh, but it it also occurs in in RNA seed. So. Uh, uh, no, I, I think we checked that, and, and no, actually not. Uh, also, um, in in ribosic, uh, you observe like the so we define as translated or we quantify the whole isoforms, and then that's why we we look uh, into the microexon because they since they are uh, that short, uh, maybe you are able to quantify the the isoform, but you don't have reads. Uh, mapping there, but no, uh, we we didn't find an enrichment in in police. Thank you very much. Okay. Um,